This is a prayer for joy in God's creation. O heavenly Father who has filled the world with beauty, open our eyes to behold your gracious hand in all your works, that rejoicing in your whole creation, we may learn to serve you with gladness for the sake of the God through whom all things were made. Your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay, the floor is all yours, Ross. Okay, so... Um, I'm assuming everybody can see um, the presentation slide here. So today we're going to talk about um, Byzantium, the Byzantine Empire, and Orthodox Christianity, um, which I argue, I'm going to try to argue in this um, in this presentation is different enough for from us in the Western tradition, um, whether you're Christian or not, you don't you you know you you absorb some stuff from from Western Christianity and um, and so a lot of the stuff in the Byzantine um, art is is fairly foreign I think to most Westerners. Um, so we're going to start. I'm just going to mention we're not going to really go over the archi architecture in this presentation because it I don't think it's as important for us and um, and it gets kind of complicated. But I just wanted to give you a picture of one of the most famous pieces of Byzantine art um, and architecture, which is Hagia Sophia in modern day Istanbul. Um, you can see the minarets, the tall towers on the outside, those were added by um, the Ottoman Turks after they conquered the city. Um, so the, it's, it's mostly just the central building with the big dome on top. That's what is Byzantine. Um, and I'm sure you've seen pictures of the inside as well. Um, but again, we're not gonna focus on the Hagia Sophia, even though I had a professor once tell me it was the pinnacle of all art. So, um, but we're gonna focus on some other stuff in, and I like to do that in lectures um, so that people get an idea of some, uh, some more obscure things. Um, so we're gonna start off with a brief history of the Byzantine Empire. It was founded in the fourth, early fourth century by Constantine the Great after his reunification of the Roman Empire following a period of intense civil war. The city was established as a quote, new Rome intended to supersede the older city in Italy. <coughs> the Byzantine state was seen by its citizens as a direct continuation of the Roman state. They were Romans or Romaioi in Greek, even if the city of Rome itself was not part of their empire. And this, this mindset continued right up until the end. They really saw themselves as the legitimate Romans. Um, the people who lived in Rome after um, the fall of the Western Roman Empire, those weren't Romans, those were barbarians. Um, they passed, the early Byzantines passed on an appreciation of classical literature and art to be seen as aesthetic corpuses, desacralizing them in order to maintain them alongside Christianity. So it's really thanks to the Byzantines, not the people who lived in Italy that we have classical, we have an appreciation, not only have the objects themselves, but we have an appreciation for classical literature and classical art. So from the beginning with Constantine, the emperor, and this is important, um, was seen as not only having a mandate from God, but he was also the spiritual primary, inter, I'm sorry, intermediary between God and the people as a whole body politic. The emperor was believed to have a personal relationship with Christ and was seen as a king or basilius in Greek in the tradition of the traditional in the tradition of the biblical kings of Judea. In other words, he was divinely appointed. He therefore had sacerdotal as well as political responsibilities within the empire and particularly within the city of Constantinople. And um, the name Byzantine or Byzantium 
comes from, as you can see on the map here, it says Byzantium underneath Constantinople. That was the um, original Greek settlement that predated Constantine's founding of Constantinople. So it's just kind of for shorthand that in the West, we call it Byzantium, um, in part because Constantinople is hard to say, and in part because it doesn't exist anymore. Um, it's just a factor of history or product of history that we call it Byzantium and not Constantinople or Constantinople and Bien. I don't even know exactly what the adjective is. Um, so as you can see in the sixth century, the red line, that was what was reconquered um, by the Emperor Justinian I, and we'll see him towards the end in a picture. Um, he reconquered all the part that's surrounded by the red line, but then over time, um, that was lost so that in about 1020, you can see they controlled the pink area. And then in about 1360 towards the end, they only controlled the dark red area. Um, after the fall of the Western Empire, nominally in 476 CE, like I said, there was a brief resurgence under Justinian I. Um, but after the rise of Islam most and the invasion of the Goths in the West, um, that was or the, the retaking of the West by the Goths um, and the Germanic tribes that was quickly lost. So the period of the seventh and eighth centuries was very dark for Constantinople. The people afflicted by bubonic plague and the empire hemmed in by the Arab conquests as well as divided by the iconoclasm controversy, which we'll go over later. And I also wanted to say, if anybody wants to, um, has any comments, feel free to um, type them in and we'll try to do as much discussion at the end as possible. Um, so in the medieval times, even though it wasn't at the heart of a really great empire, I mean, it was significant, you know, compared to today in terms of what you can see with the pink area. Um, it, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a great empire in the way that Rome had been. Um, historically or historiographically, really it's, it's more notable as a major entrepot between the West and the East, a bottleneck of trade really across the medieval world. It sat right smack dab in the middle and really made a, a difference in how the West and the East um, interacted with each other. Um, and this, it's, its role as an entrepot along with the inheritance of Roman bureaucracy and law very much enriched the city and continued its um, helped to continue its, its being seen as a pinnacle of culture throughout the medieval world, medieval era. So although there was a still sense of its classical heritage though, it was very much Christian and devotional. The structure of the city was defined after the year 1000 by the establishment of the, by the emperor of large urban monasteries that took over the administration of various city functions. Um, um, so it's declining and conquest. Um, the invasion of the Seljuk Turks, these are not the Ottomans, but a different kind of Turk, different group of Turks, in the late 11th century led in turn to an incursion of Western powers in the form of the Crusades, leading ultimately to the worst disaster, the sacking of the city during the Fourth Crusade in 1204 by the Western or Latin Crusaders. Only fragments of the empire remained in Greek hands as the Latins led by the Venetians ruled the city for nearly six decades before being removed. Um, the Ottomans, which were a different group of Turks, captured the last Greek city on the Aegean um, right here in 1304. 
and reach the Marmara Sea, which is this sea right here, um, opposite Constantinople. So it was only due to the immense fortifications that the city had that they inherited from the classical era um, and their powerful navy that they were allowed to hold on to their city until 1453 when Mehmet II um, finally conquered the city and the empire finally fell completely. Um, okay, so in the interest of time. So um, we're first gonna talk about icons. And I think this is besides the mosaics, one of the more famous parts of, or uh, parts of genres of media of, uh, of Byzantine art and Orthodox art today as well. <laughs> so archons are mentioned as being venerated in private as early as the beginning of the cent third century. They appear in first in domestic settings Appropriate since the home was to remain within orthodoxy, the primary place for the development of icon veneration, which was important because it afforded women a place in worship when the public religion controlled by the priests was, was controlled solely by men. In the early fourth century, Eusebius of Caesarea compared icon veneration to the honoring of images of saviors by ancient pagans. These savior images are believed to be the direct ancestors of the Christian icon. And so like in a lot of things, the Christians developed uh, a way of pasting over, of, of re-inheriting of inheriting and reinterpreting the pagan, um, the pagan world. So the stylization of the pagan images foreshadows that of Christian icons. They were static, they were frontally posed, and they paid minimal attention to anatomy or spatial setting. Even the halo can be seen in these depictions of pagan deities. So we're gonna compare first these two images of Heron, which was, who was a, um, Heron was a guardian god for travelers um, who became particularly um, popular in Egypt in the first centuries. Um, so we can see him and a warrior or a, a soldier on the left. Heron is the, um, the god on the left and the soldier is on the right. So you can see again, like I said, how the the program of icons can can be descended from from this type of savior image um and so we can see again the the similarity between this icon from the sixth century on the right to something that was developed in 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 the pagan world in the beginning of the third century So there was also a definite delineation from Roman portrait painting. A lot of people are probably familiar with um, images of, from the Fayum in Egypt of so-called mummy paintings or mummy portraits. So we have Christ the Saint Menas on the left um, and Saint Peter in the middle and the Fayum um, Roman portrait on the right. And so again, we can see the, um, the similarities between the two in the way that they're frontally posed. There's, no, there's very little background um, or minimal background, um, but you can see the, the similarities between St. Peter in the middle and the, the the way that the anatomy was drawn between St. Peter in the middle and the, the Fayum portrait on the right. Um, and then we see even more of a similarity between the, the portrait in the middle and the blessing Christ on the right here in this slide. 
Um, and although they were very important for the home, um, they were also important in ecclesiastical worship. And this, um, this is another form of the blessing Christ on the right here. Uh, and this is from a church in Anatolia, I believe. Um, and we'll go over that in a little bit later with regards to iconoclasm. So again, we can see how, like I said before, there was a really a, a great um, inheritance from the classical world. Um, and that was very important for the Byzantines in the development of their art. So I'll go back to this slide um, and I'm gonna talk about iconoclasm. Iconoclasm, which is the, it, I think, I believe it literally means the breaking of icons. Um, it was a movement that began under the Emperor Leo III in 726 when he promulgated an edict against icons. It was argued that they separated Christ's nature from his divine as only the human could be depicted in physical form. They also degraded the status of the Eucharist as the center of worship when they were placed before the altar. <laughs> and this was stated by the Council of Hyrea in 754. Um, and so there was a great tumult in, in the Byzantine Empire of, over whether icons should be displayed or not. There were great large factions on either side. Um, and much of the reason why we don't have art from before the eighth century is because much of it was destroyed. Um, almost all movable icons, you know, portable icons are lost to us. And much of the monumental art that was created before the eighth century um, was also was also destroyed. And so most of what we have of Byzantine art really comes from afterwards. And so the icons that I showed you um, here are some of the few that we that we know of that we have in, in, in our possession. The argument against lay against iconoclasm lay in saying icons were an assertion of the full humanity of Christ and that the image itself was quote transparent in the sense that it was the saint or Christ who was being worshiped through the veneration of the icon and not the physical icon itself. And the second council of Nicaea put these arguments forward and restored icons in 787. However, it was again revived by Leo V, the Armenian in 813, although not as popular as before. Um, and iconoclasm was finally put to rest by the Empress Theodora in 843 after the death of her husband, the Emperor Theophilus. This signaled the triumph of popular religious practice over imperial policy for iconoclasm had never been popular among the majority of the empire citizens. And again, like I said, um, you can see this image of the blessing Christ on the right is damaged, especially his hands and his face have been effaced away. So after iconoclasm, icons became pervasive in the city as they had before, used in many different contexts. And I'm gonna go to, these two. Um, they, um, the Hoda Getria, an icon originally brought from Palestine. Um, and we see a copy of the Hoda Getria on the left, um, although the original was lost later on. It was the most prized and the most copied. It was used for important religious, political, and military occasions. And it was believed to be the miraculous creation of St. Luke the Evangelist. Similarly, similarly there were the so-called Archaea Poetia, literally not made by hands, icons that were believed to have been created by divine agency 
and which were known to miraculously replicate, um, very convenient in some cases. Often they were bilateral, that is painted on both sides and so that they could be carried along in processions. Common combination was of the virgin child on one side and the crucifixion on the other. Um, by the 11th century, the appearance of icons changed, incorporating more narrative elements and expressing um, more poignant emotions. So we can see, I, I accidentally switched the sides, slides here, but um, you can see on the right, this is an icon from later in the 14th to 15th centuries, but nevertheless, you can see there's all these narrative scenes around the central Christ figure. And they're all labeled, in fact, so we know what they are. Um, and you can see uh, some of the classical um, and Hellenistic tradition in the piece on the left. Um, this is a, like a treasure, I believe a treasure box or of some kind. Uh, but it's it's all carved in ivory, and you can see the the vines um, and the way that the figures, the dancing figures within each of the the panels or little circles there. Um, that's that represents or uh, is a good representation of again the Hellenistic culture, the the Greek culture, the classical culture um, that was incorporated throughout this, this time. Um, so these changes towards a more narrative um, and more pointing emotions in, in the figures, um, this encouraged worshipers to forge a personal relationship to the holy figure or enter into the narrative as if actually present at the event. This idea of entering the image and connecting with the subject emotionally would re be reproduced and elaborated upon in the West a few centuries later. So next I wanna talk a little bit about um, the Virgin Mary and her role as um, Theotokos or mother of God. Um, her place in Orthodoxy um, of the Byzantine era and to a large extent Orthodoxy of today as well it differed a bit from how she was viewed in the West. Um, in, Byzant in Byzantium, her purity as a virgin was less stressed as indicated by her title, mother of God, or God bearer is another way to translate Theotokos. In this role as Theotokos, she was not just the mother of Christ, but embraced all of life. I'm gonna give a list of epithets that were given to her. They included mother of the unsetting star, dawn of the mystical day, rock that quenches thirst, column of fire, tent of the world, flower of immortality, land flowing with milk and honey, impregnable wall, vehicle of the cherubim and living temple. So the, the Theotokos, what we can what we call the Virgin Mary was so it was not just an icon uh, uh, something someone to be venerated or someone to intercede on your behalf, but she was this all pervasive figure within the theology, within the thinking of the Orthodox Church at the time, and like I said, to a large extent, to this day as well. Um, another big difference um, that we see is in what's called the Dormition of, um, or the falling asleep of Mary. I, there's the legend that she fell asleep, other, uh, in Greek called koimesis, and she ascended into heaven alive rather than actually dying. And we can see the difference um, between the two in that in the West, this is depicted as the assumption. On the right, we can see um, a 
folio from a manuscript in the Morgan Library, um, originally made in Paris. This is, you know, very much in the Western tradition. We've seen this, be you've probably seen this before, Mary on a crescent moon with a crown rising into, um, into heaven, surrounded by angels. On the left, the iconic, the iconic, uh, the iconography was very much of her falling asleep and being taken up into heaven. You can see on the left, Christ is, she's sleeping on the, on the beer on the bottom. Um, and then Christ above her is raising her. The little child figure is actually supposed to be Mary. Um, he's taking her away symbolically. Um, actually, I want to go ahead. Does anybody have any questions so far? If you do, just type or unmute yourself and say something. No? Okay. Trying. Let's see. I'm trying. Okay. Um, so now we're going to move on to architecture. Um, I should say architectural art. Um, this is a very famous um, this is a very famous piece of art or a set, set of pieces of art. Um, it's the Basilica of San, San Vitale in Ravenna, which is a city. Uh, I'm not going to go back all the way to the, the map at the beginning, but it's a city in, in northeastern Italy. And again, if you remember, this was um, the time in the sixth century when Italy was controlled by the emperor in Constantinople. And because it was built in Italy and it wasn't affected by the iconoclasm co uh, controversy that happened um, a century later, century two later, um, this is one of the only pe preserved pieces of uh, Byzantine mosaic that we have from before the iconoclasm controversy. Um, so talk, to talk a little bit about the churches themselves, um, they're widely regarded in, in the history um, as a pinnacle of, of really of artistic and cultural achievement. Um, the liturgy of the churches is very well documented. And so we know a great deal about the purpose behind the construction and decoration of the churches and the impact of the emotional experience that worship made on congregants. And we'll come to that a bit later as well. Um, when ambassadors of Vladimir the Great of Kiev, who went on to convert the Kievan Rus, ancestors of modern Russia and Ukraine to Orthodox Christianity, went to Constantinople in 987, they compared their experience of Hagia Sophia, the church we saw at the beginning, to Muslim and Roman Catholic rites. Quote, we knew not whether we were in heaven or on earth. For on earth, there is no such splendor or such beauty. And we are at a loss how to describe it. We know only that God dwells among men and their service is fairer than the ceremonies of other nations. For we cannot forget that beauty. Every man after tasting something sweet is afterward unwilling to accept that which is bitter, and therefore we cannot dwell longer here. So in other words, they were so overblown by the art that when they went back to Vladimir the Great of Kiev, orthodoxy was, was the religion rather than Islam or, um, or Roman Catholicism that he adopted, um, in large part based on the splendor of Byzantine churches. So churches, um, Byzantine churches can be divided into three basic categories, cathedrals, um, the principal churches of monasteries, and then private domestic chapels. But what's more decisively different is the contrast between the early churches 
and those after the crisis of the seventh and eighth centuries. Um, these differences can be separated into three categories, architecture, iconic, icono iconography, and liturgy. Early churches were open public spaces influenced by the tradition of the Roman Basilica, while later ones were closed and compact. Early icono iconography consisted of loose narrative programs, while later depictions stuck to a strictly selective set of subjects. Before the crisis, the ceremonial emphasized participatory processional movement, while afterwards there was a shift towards a more static ritual dominated by appearances and presentations of liturgical objects by the clergy. So we're gonna zoom in a little bit on, on the apps here in San Vitale. Um, so the above on the top, um, you see Christ surrounded by angels and um, Saint Vitalis, the patron saint, I believe on the left, yes, and Bishop Ecclesius, the founder of the church on the right. Um, and then on the bottom, we have um, we have on the bottom, we have uh, the male part of the procession, and on the right, we have the female part of the procession. And at the time, and I think possibly still today, um, in Orthodox churches, women and men are sat on separate sides of the church. Um, and so in a way, it's actually more, more equal than what was going on in the West at the time in which men were sitting in front and women behind. Um, they were still separated, but it, they were co-equal in a way. On the left, we see the Emperor Justinian I making an offering. He's the one on the left in the crown. Um, um, and then we have the presiding bishop, Maximanius. He's the one you can see his name above him on the left there. He is actually in front. So you can, if you imagine, if you, we go back here and we see below to the right, we see the women there, um, the women's procession. The men's procession is on the other side of the apse opposite the women's procession. So you can see how the Bishop Maximanius is actually in front of the emperor in the procession in the Emperor Justinian. Um, although Justinian was never believed to have actually gone to Ravenna, um, this was the fact that he's included, represented is an, is an homage, was an homage, considered an homage to him um, as a patron of the church. Um, and then on the right, we have the Empress at the time, and I forgot to put her name in the notes. Um, <laughs> But, um, but again, there's this idea of, of um, her being led by probably, I would assume, deacons of some kind in front of her. Um, and then we have a very rare piece of art. Um, it's called Encounter in, with God. Um, other, in other words, for the presentation in the temple known as in the West. Um, this is from a church in Istanbul from the sixth century. I believe it's from Istanbul. Um, and I wanna note Simeon, if you remember the, the story, if you don't or you don't know, this is when um, Christ's parents took him to the temple and the priest, uh, Simeon, was recognized, um, recognized Christ as, as the Messiah and, um, and ran towards him. And then because he finally met the Messiah, he was promised to meet the Messiah before he died. And so once he met the Messiah, he was overjoyed and then was finally able to pass away. 
Um, but what I want you to note in this is how he's running towards the child. He's emphasizing his recognition of God rather than Mary and Joseph offering, Mary and Joseph's offering of their child. So this is where it differs from the West. Whereas in the West, Simeon's running towards him is not emphasized. Um, he's more, again, Christ is presented as a, almost as a sacrifice by his parents in a way. Um, that's what's emphasized in the West. In the East, in Orthodoxy, the the jubilation the over Christ being savior is really emphasized in this. And again, we, we can recall um, the Hellenistic tradition when we look at the dynamism that we see in Simeon's body. Okay, so we're gonna move next to the transfiguration. Um, this is in Daphne in Greece in the church of the Dormition. And we have Moses and Elijah on either side as the apostles are sleeping down below. Um, or one of the apostles is sleeping down below and the other is, is seeing um, Christ's transfiguration. And this is, of course, one of the most um, mysterious parts of the of the of the gospel and yet um it was um it was very important in in the theology of um of the orthodox church so we see here that christ is facing us frontally and Moses and Elijah on the left and right are turned in three quarter poses against the concavity of the of the vault of the of the ceiling in a way that allows them to speak to one another across the space and this allows the viewer to actually inhabit the space in a way and this creates a realism of perspective that is the opposite really of the later Renaissance illusionistic perspective, which, to car which attempts to carve out imaginary space behind the picture plane. So the difference is that the scene is coming out into our space and we are inhabiting that space. And this is very important in, again, in the theology. Um, of the Orthodox Church, because in the Orthodox Church, the incarnation is really emphasized a lot more than the sacrifice on the cross. And so being within um, the space is seen as more important. Um, and so that's why the development was made. The scene of the transfiguration, this particular setup of the scene is also quintessentially Byzantine. Um, and it really doesn't occur, the transfiguration doesn't really occur in Western art, um, except when it's borrowed from Byzantine art. Um, another word for it, another word for, in Greek, the word for, trans, for the transfiguration is metamorphosis. You might recognize that word. Um, it's commonly translated as transformation. So again, I wanna dwell on this a little bit to get, again, to get the idea that this is a different way of viewing space um, as produced by the image and how the viewer interacts with that space. Um, it's different, very different from that, what we see in the West, certainly different from what we see um, in the medieval West where everything was very flat, but also different again from the perspective that was developed in the Renaissance, where there was a, you have a flat plane of, of the picture and everything happens behind that plane. In this case, oops, sorry. In this case, everything is happening within, before you, 
you're you're a part of the space that the figures are occupying. Um, and that goes a lot into how um, how worshipers were involved in the worship. They were um, when they were especially when they received the Eucharist itself. Um, they saw themselves as joining kind of a divine, not world, but they were, yeah, they were joining the divine in a way, participating in the divine by participating in the Eucharist, participating in worship. And the pictures such as these, which came out into your space that you interacted with, um, was all in part with that. Um, again, we see this in um, the washing of the feet. Um, where we have um, this movement across the space. Um, and it's, this is situated, you can see this is situated in a dome. And so the people on the left and the people on the right are kind of interacting with each other and creating the space that we can enter into. So next I'm gonna talk about um, what's called Christ Pantocrator. Um, it's translated literally as all ruling or all holding as in holding something. Um, and it, the idea behind the image on the left of Christ Pantocrator, um, this is really the central um, image within the church that was, that was developed. It lies in the top of the dome above the worshipers as they were taking the Eucharist. And again, this is to provide recognition, the idea that Christ is above you, that you're becoming part of him. You're becoming as a worshiper, part of the divine as you participate in the sacrament. Um, and I also wanna note the, the similarity between the Christ Pantocrator on the left um, from the late 11th century and the icon from the sixth century on the right. Um, we can see the differences in how they're holding um, the gospel, um, how they're holding their right hand in blessing. Um, and so, again, Christ is seen as an intercessor, not just as an intercessor, but as someone who is all pervasive throughout creation. Though, of course, not in a pantheistic sense of, of things. Um, even above Christ, the image of Christ, we have the cross itself. Um, this is a processional cross um, currently at the Met. And um, the cross is really central. It was above even the images on the walls. Um, and even during the period of iconoclasm, um, the iconoclasts, the people who advocated for the destroying of images, even they didn't argue with the idea of the cross. Um, the one shown here wouldn't have been used during the celebration of the Eucharist. It was more of a parade cross. Um, it's a little bit smaller than what would have been in the church. Um, and what's to note, of course, is that it's very different from the contemporary Roman Catholic tradition, which includes the body of Christ. Again, in a way similar to the Protestant theology that developed later, um, the, lack of the, the lack of the crucified Christ is meant to symbolize his victory over death. Um, the cross is used purely as a symbol and not as 
a an appeal to sympathy with Christ as sacrifice. Again, like I said before, the sacrificial Christ was not emphasized um, in orthodoxy. Um, the last thing I want to touch upon is this image. Um, it was created in Crete. At the time, Crete was owned by the Venetians in the in the in the fifteenth century. Um, it was created in the city of Candia, now the capital of of Crete, now called Heraklion. And I want you to note um, this is kind of a you know, like I said, the the island at the time was owned by the Venetians, but it was still very much a Greek. Um, Greek place Crete was at the time. Um, so we note the rocks in the in the back. Um, those are very much Byzantine. Um, but the the image in the in the foreground of Christ carrying the cross is a very Western image. And so we think that this was probably made for a Western market, essentially. Um, the so and probably an Italian market because the soldier on the right is in Italian armor. However, interestingly, the soldiers on the left are in Byzantine or Cretan armor. So this is a good example of the transition, part of the ways in which the Byzantine, the Byzantine art transitioned into our Western tradition. Um, a lot of the iconography that we think of as classically of the Italian Renaissance, in fact, comes <laughs> from, from the Byzantine era. Um, and we really have to recognize how much of the iconography was copied and reinterpreted um, and has had an influence on Western religious arts ever since then. So what you see today in your church um, in terms of figural iconography ultimately descended from what the Byzantines developed over millennia ago. And so despite seeming rigid and formalistic, it was actually deeply humanistic. Like I said, it was, the idea was interpret, in, inhabiting the space, um, connecting with the subject of the icon on a very personal level. And like I mentioned at the beginning, most icons were, for, were um, displayed in the home. Um, and and so we can see this as really a, a way of recognizing the humanity of a, of a culture which I think in the West is um, is largely dismissed as arcane and um, I mean we can we can see the um, the very word Byzantine itself. Is, is usually used in a derogatory way. Um, so that's what I wanted to end on. Oh, and I forgot to mention um, in the picture, we can see on the right, a detail that's, um, that's the title in Greek. And then on the left in, in Latin, we have the, um, the artist's name. So that's it, we've got, about six minutes till 11, um, till church starts. Um, so if anybody wants to unmute themselves or go into the chat um, and ask a question, please feel free. Ross, there is a question there about later beyond the split between Orthodox and Roman traditions. If these, any of these churches became Catholic churches, and if so, how were they modified? Do you know? Um, like I believe the the Basilica of San Vitale in in Ravenna, 
I believe is now a Catholic church. Um, I don't think they were really all that modified. Um, most in the West, again, there was no period of iconoclasm that occurred um, to any great extent that I know of. Um, and so things were largely preserved as, as they were. Um, the, the decoration of the Byzantine churches was done mostly in mosaic. And so it, it would have been, it, there wasn't really any point in taking it down. Um, it wasn't seen as heretical in any way by the Catholic church, as far as I know. Um, I mean, the schism happened in a lot of ways due to political factors more than religious factors, mm -hmm. theological factors, as far as I understand. Yeah. Um, so yeah, most of, and again, that's why we have what we have of Byzantine art. It survives mostly in Italy. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing I was going to add, having been in a Byzantine chapel, is that what Roman Catholicism tended to do come the Middle Ages was add more crucifixes rather, so it was adding on to, it wasn't right. really taking away from. Right, right. And I mean, I imagine that there were probably portable icons that were removed over time and were lost, um, various pieces of furniture that were original to the Byzantine era um, that was lost that we don't have anymore, but that's the case for, you know, stuff that was created in the West in the first place. Yep. Um, and in a lot of ways, because they used mosaic, it was a lot more durable than the fresco um, that was popular in the West from the beginning. Right. Um, and a lot easier to repair because exactly. most churches are subject to earthquakes. That's yeah. People don't. Actually. Yeah, Italy, of course, is a hot spot for earthquakes. Yeah. And so um, a lot of it's, and, and Greece is too, of course. Yes. Um, but the major reason we don't have a lot of stuff in Greece and the Balkans is largely due to, as far as I understand, um, the just constant warfare that went on there over the centuries after the, the Byzantine Empire fell. Well, and before... I should say before it fell, when it was conquered by the Ottomans and the, or first the Seljuks and then the Ottomans. Um, and, and then just constant warfare. And, and to be honest, a lot of repression of the, um, of the Christians in that area. Um, the, um, can you hear me? Yeah. The Byzant, although the Constantinople fell, the actual court removed to Trebizond on your map and survived as a tiny little, um, not even an empire. And it fell eventually in the mm, middle to late 15th century. Way, okay. Yeah, it's way out. Yeah. yeah See I, Trebizond over there? That, I'm not familiar with that history, so that's, that's really interesting. They yeah, removed Trebizond from Constantinople also, to Trebizond and they, it was, yeah. they just kept moving farther east. Yeah, and they, and Trebizond was another city that was a big um, trading entrepot. Right. Um, that lay on the, 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 um, the crossroads between the east and the west, especially with China. Trebizond was very important for the, um, the, the Silk Road routes. Yeah. Anybody else have any comments or questions? The other thing that I would add is having been on Crete, that there is a lot that's well preserved there from every century of history, but but in, including the great palace of Knossos, but, mm. um, which is what most people go to Crete to see. Right, I would imagine. And But what's interesting to me is that because in the Roman times, people from Crete were kind of like considered like people from Oh, pardon me if you were born there, West Virginia. <laughs> um, 
that was a real insult to say that you were, you know, someone, oh, they must be from Crete. And um, so it, and then the Venetians held it for so long, it protected it. All of the ruins there were well protected. Nobody paid any attention to them for a very long time. Yeah. The Venetians and the Genoese um, yes. had great rivalry in that area. There were um, sources of nat or natural resources in that area that were used extensively. Alum was one of them, mm. used in dyeing, um, used in the wool trades. And uh, so between the two of them, they, they fought over control of a lot of these. It's amazing for all of the artifacts you can find there and see in the museums. Yeah. We forget that cultures move back and forth and there's no strict division, between a formal division between what we call Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy. That came much later and, and as Ross said, is very political, but they influenced each other. Yeah. Yeah, and, um, and, uh, and like I said before, I think it's lost on a lot of people who study Western history, Western art history, how much, um, how much was inherited from the East. Um, it, was really, it was really seen, like I said at the beginning, it was really seen as a pinnacle of, of art and culture right up until it fell, really, even though, um, you know, in the 14th century and, and the 15th century, it was a, you know, sliver of its former self. Um, as we can see on the map here, um, I mean, it, it barely controlled any territory. Even then, it was seen as, as, a, as an incredible place that to be looked up to by, by people both in the West, in, in the Christian West, and in, in the Islamic East. Um, the, the Muslims also saw Constantinople, um, or Rum, as they called it. They called them the Rumi, or Romans. Um, they saw them as, as a pinnacle, kind of, as a, as a, as a great, great um, culture. If you go into a modern Orthodox church, um, they have a very large screen at the front called an iconostasis, mm -hmm. yeah. which is hung with icons. The, um, the actual Eucharist and everything kind of takes place behind it. Yeah. And very few people go behind it or allowed behind it. Yeah. Speak, speak. And it actually used to be the case in a way in the Western church. Mm -hmm. um, we, have, we have rude screens and rude screen, exactly. things to keep people out. Yes. Speaking of which, for those of us who um, need to join the next um, opportunity for worship, we need to hop off. Okay. So I want to thank you, Ross, very much. And I look forward to next week. Yes. Yes, it'll be. Thank you. Like I said, I'm going to try to tie in some stuff, but we'll see exactly how much I can. Okay. Thank you all so much for being with us. All right. Thank you.